Let's open our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4. As you're turning there, we're looking at the, the progression that the Apostle Paul has given to us in 1 Timothy chapter 4. The whole chapter are the disciplines that uh, God's Word instructs us to make it through the world in which we live. And each of these are building upon one another. The, the discipline of truth is coming to the place where we believe that this is the source of truth from God for our lives. Then, as we saw last week, that leads to us having a devotion to that truth, that, that we want to be connected to it, that we want to know and live and speak and defend and guard that truth that nurtures our soul. This morning, when we get to the seventh verse, we're finding the third discipline. When you have the truth and when you have a devotion to the truth, it only connects if you spend the time to let that truth transform us. And, and this, this verse that, that we're going to look at, only the first half of it actually has the, the discipline in it, tells us that we should be rejecting, and if you look down at, at what it says in verse 7, but reject, profane, an old wife old wives fables and so it says reject profane and these muthas these myths fables they're just empty of truth reject those things but it's not a, a harsh rejection it's a very interesting word what it means is there's something so much better so much greater we actually literally the greek word means to bag it off and say oh you know i can't it's, there's something surpassing. There's something I'm devoted to. That's the previous discipline. There's something that, that I believe is my source of truth. And, and profane, which are godless, and empty, which are these myths, these fables, those don't even match up to what I have. So that's just for you in your mind to look at where we're going. The discipline of truth leads to the discipline of devotion last week, leads to this discipline of time neglecting other things to truly know what God wants us to know. So this morning, I have a question for you, because one of the greatest dangers we face every day as believers is slowly allowing God's influence that he wants to have through the truth and through our devotion to that truth to slowly wane. And this condition makes God weightless in our lives. God, when he no longer weighs upon every thought, every choice, and every action of our day, is marginalized from our lives, and basically God becomes weightless. He, he doesn't exert a profound impact on our lives. And that's a, a very serious condition. I wonder how many of us this morning really think that the title of this message is for us. Uh, our time being disciplined, do we need to reject profane and empty living? And, and that's because of what I call the great disconnect. And perhaps we should do a little test this morning. First, think of uh, what the title was for today's message. The discipline of time, rejecting profane and empty living. Hmm, we think. I'm not sure I'm involved in anything that's profane, whatever that is. You know what I mean? You, you just kind of process that. Or I don't think I'm living an empty life. So that means I don't really have to think much about the next 45 minutes, right? Isn't that the test that we go through? And that's the exercise that takes place almost unconsciously across America in Bible teaching churches each week. People sit there, people notice the topic, people do a quick assessment, and people tune their thoughts to something other than the message. But now we need to go on and do the test to determine whether God has become weightless in our lives. And the test is simple. It's basically this. How much do God and his word directly challenge me into changing the way I think and live on a daily basis? Not occasionally. How much does God weigh in to challenge the way I think and the way I behave and the way I process life on a daily basis? And you can measure your growth in disciplining yourself for godliness, the other half of verse 7, in in context with this concept, how much of my daily life does God weigh in on and do I allow him to influence directly what I'm going to say, what I, my patterns of thoughts are, and the actions that I take? 
That, that's the real measurement in our life. So that brings us to this question. Is God weightless in your life this morning? I'm not talking about you're here, but I'm talking about in the, the overview of where your and my life is going. Is God weightless this morning? A believer that's not actively engaged in exercising the discipline of time by consciously rejecting profane and empty living that verse 7 talks about will slowly become amused and carried along and will be floating with the current of this world and going away from God. You see, unless we aggressively choose to engage in, in going against everything that, that is around us that's of this world, we, if we're not pushing forward and pressing toward the mark, as Paul put it, we're carried back by the current. We're, we're, we're on a river of life. The current is going away from God. He has called us to follow him and to, as it were, paddle upstream. Every day we don't paddle. We begin to float backward. And Paul said, these disciplines are engage in paddling. That doesn't mean that as a believer, we immediately go against God when we're floating. Rather, it's a slow process. And what happens is the Lord has less and less influence over my time, over my priorities, over the direction, over those little choices that gradually make up the fabric of my life. God has less and less influence over parts of my life if he is becoming weightless. Recently, a theologian, his name is David Wells, he's very gifted. He's one of the two founders of, uh, if you've ever heard, the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. Uh, he was one of the, the triggers that, that started that alliance. But he wrote an article that expressed this condition as well, and, and what, what he said it was fascinating to me. Now, this is a man... He used to be at Trinity, and now he's at Gordon-Conwell, and, and he is uh, one of the people that thinks kind of stratospherically. In fact, a lot of times you have to read over and over what he says because it, it's so profound that, that you can't take, it's kind of like a, a, a bite of steak too big. You have to cut it smaller and smaller so that you can get it in. But this is what he said. I want to read it to you. It is one of the defining marks of our culture that God has now become weightless. I do not mean that God is ethereal, but rather God has become unimportant. He rests upon our world so inconsequentially as to not even be noticed. God has lost his saliency for human life. Now, he's just, he's, he's broad brushing, but he's, he's doing well. Wells goes on to say, those who assure the pollsters here in America that their belief in God's existence is sound may nonetheless demonstrate by their habits and belief these, these truths. And, and I, I typed them out for you. I'll read them to you, but I, I typed them out so you can think about it. Number one, God is less interesting than television. Now, now what he's talking about is the pollsters go out and say, are you a, are you a Christian? Yes. Then they poll them as to where does the Bible fit in relation to your media consumption. And what you find is, no matter though they say they're a Christian, God is less interesting than television. God's commands contained in his word are less authoritative than their appetites for affluence and influence. Affluence, I want more material things. Influence, I don't want to be you know, out of touch with my culture, I want them to accept me and I want to be in there as a part of the influence rather than being a follower of God's authoritative word. Thirdly, God's judgments are no more awe-inspiring than the evening news. How's he, well, how do you come up with that? That people are more drawn to, to watching over and over again as the news cycle goes, whatever is going on, you know, right now in the Ukraine or, or previous to that at the Olympics before it was interrupted or what's starting to erupt in Venezuela or the old news, which is Syria. God's word is no more awe-inspiring. It doesn't, like a magnet, grip us <laughs> than the evening news. They're kind of, in fact, the evening news often wins over God. And finally, he said, God's truth is less compelling than the advertiser's sweet fog of flattery and lies. That's weightlessness. It's a condition we have assigned God to after having nudged him out to the periphery 
of our secularized lives. See, we were called to have God-centric lives. But God has been nudged out as the core of our lives become secularized. You know what that means? That means that, that we see a difference between our church life and our real world life. But for a believer, there's no difference between the sacred and the secular. It's all merged together into one life we live for the glory of God. Weightlessness tells us nothing about God, but everything about ourselves. And therefore, we need to realize that we must not exclude God from our reality. Well, now, what are we going to do? We're going to learn in our text and look down and, and we're going to read in just a moment, verse 7. We need to battle profane and empty living. And Paul wrote down, as God's Spirit moved him to write, these disciplines. The first one, this one of truth. The second one, the discipline of devotion. Now in verse 7, uh, the discipline of, of our time. If we were in the first century, this would have jumped off the page to us. In fact, for most of us, uh, in fact, I, I was just listening to, to uh, my son telling us that he's studying in Argentina and he's, he's in an immersion Spanish uh, course, a year long, to become fluent in Spanish in a, in a missionary training center. And he said, I'm learning more English grammar, learning Spanish, than I learned in America. Because he says, you have to understand the grammar uh, to understand the language. And he said, and so all of this is tied to English grammar. You know, most of us, uh, you know, unless you're one of those English buffs, you just kind of let it go by. That wasn't how it was in the first century. In fact, I want to show you our text. I, I've, if, I'm going to put it up on a screen for you. Uh, this is, it, I colored for you the imperatives. Do you see anything that's a different color on the page of the normal letters? That's how this text would have looked when in the first century it arrived from Paul to Timothy. You see, the grammar of the, the imperative is an ending that jumps off the page. And so I put it into flame orange, fluorescent orange. And what's amazing is Paul has written six solid verses of truths about these disciplines. But when he comes to this, this third discipline, all of a sudden he frames it in the pay attention mode, the imperative mode, uh, the, the form of the, the language that emphasizes those who received it would have instantly seen. This is what the text looks like. Remember, in the Greek language, there's a built-in method for showing what is emphasized. By use of grammatical form, statements can be bolded and highlighted for emphasis. And that emphasis is called the imperative mood. And in verse 7, we bump right into the first of 12 words between verse 7 and the end of the chapter that Paul is underscoring and saying, don't let this go by you. Don't, don't fail to notice this truth. So basically, these emphasized truths are what the Lord wants us to give our attention to. If God could have used any greater method to bunch together a dozen requests, I can't think of it. So these words, reject and exercise, jump off the page in verse 7. God designed it that way. That's exactly what he wants us to notice. The proximity suggests a contrast. Reject the profane and old wives' fables, but exercise yourself toward the godly, the true, what matters forever. God is explaining that to get the best results from our exercises or disciplines, we must, we must pay attention. So basically, in, in our text, we're looking at two, two separate pieces. First, he says, I want you to, to reject the profane. The profane is whatever is associated with godless things. Anything that, that distracts our minds. A godless thing is something that, that bumps God into the margin. And, and it does it by deadening our minds. It does it by distracting our minds. It does it by numbing our minds, by, by filling our minds with things that, that, that grieve the Spirit of God. Any of those things are profane. Secondly, he says, watch out for these old 
wives' tales, these, these muthas, myths. And, and fables are just that. They're thoughts and activities that are untrue, that are unprofitable, that we shouldn't invest our most precious resource of time in, and they're the, the most vital activity of thinking deeply shouldn't be focused on this. And by the way, you know, again, we're thinking, how does this relate to me? Do you know in the first century what myths were? Most of the myths, the mythology of the first century were about superheroes. You know, the, the Zeus, king of the gods, Apollo, Hercules, the, all of these different, what we call Greek mythology is what captivated people's minds. And he says, don't let your minds be captivated by myths. Do you know where our, our entertainment culture is going? Where's it going? To comic books. And, and people wait in line and can't wait for the next installment of fables, of myths, of science fiction, of fictitious characters that, that they actually, people begin to live in a world of fables. Well, Paul says, biblical exercises for spiritual health and fitness are for us today. So, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to read together verse 7. Let's stand together for the reading of God's word and with, with these concepts in our heart. Let's, let's listen to the verse and then let's bow before the Lord and say, Lord, if, if you want this to jump off the page and if you wrote it that way, then I'm inviting you to jump off the page into my heart and I'm going to invite you to weigh on my life. I don't want you to be weightless, God. I want you to weigh in so I can learn what it is you're asking me to do in verse 7. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote, 1 Timothy 4, 7. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, I pray that we would learn this morning by your Spirit this biblical exercise so that we can be spiritually healthy and fit in this year that's before us. It's a choice we make. It's a choice of our diet, whether we're going to be in your word. It's a choice of exercise, whether we're going to train and exercise and discipline ourselves the way you have told us, toward your truth, toward devoting ourselves to be connected to you, Every day, not just letting these words be words, but seeing them as, as a way to know you personally. And Lord, I pray that we would come to the point where we would begin to reject. We would beg off and say, yeah, I, I don't want to do that. It distracts me. It, it, it deadens me to hearing God's voice. And I want to discipline my time and not fill my mind with what is profane and not fill my mind with what is empty, false, myths, fables. I want to be an expert in truth, not in fables. Oh Lord, may we discipline our time, examine our hearts, and let you weigh into our lives moment by moment. In the name of Jesus we ask this. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, I want you to think about what God is asking. God is saying, I want your mind surrendered to my control. Now, remember, everything is based on our minds. Our body gradually follows where our mind has already been. It's, it's, we, are, we are led and driven and most influenced by our minds. And the Lord says, I want you to have a mind surrendered to my control. And God is looking for godly and, and matured believers who will make it a lifelong goal to resist the temptation of self-absorption. See, when, when we get distracted, when God becomes out there ethereally weightless, it's because we've been absorbed in ourself and our own thoughts and plans and amusements and, and, and what pleases us and what we enjoy and, and just basically our default settings. Because our flesh is the default. If we're not aggressively yielding and surrendering to the Spirit, we default to the flesh. And it just, it just looks us downward, and, and we don't look up. 
People of Paul's day, by the way, were immersed in a self-seeking and a lust-feeding culture. I mean, that's, that's just saying it mildly. When they came to Christ, they had to go on living in the world, though. And to make it through life without getting neutralized and defeated and sidelined, Paul said that the key to godly living is right here. And what he's saying in the seventh verse is, we are learning and avoiding what displeases God. You see, the discipline of truth tells us what is true and what matters. The discipline of devotion says, God, you're more important than anything else. I want to stay connected to you. And the discipline of time is that, therefore, I'm going to avoid anything that's profane or that is a fable that displeases you. See, it's just interconnected. It's amazing. These exercises from God are to train ourselves into regularly seeking out what pleases him. In a world that the New Testament was written, saints learned they had to avoid the overpowering culture of amusements. Most Roman citizens were drawn to the gaming world of spectacles in the arena. In fact, we all know the history of Rome, the decline, Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. It, it started in the heart of Rome itself, the, the, not the empire, but the city of Rome, where the people, the, the masses, had to be entertained. And once they started entertaining them in those huge events, the, the entertainment wow factor began to diminish, and so they had to, to up the, the entertainment level, and they had to up the wow factor, and, and finally, it, it wasn't enough to just see, you know, chariot race. You had to have a chariot race with knives on it so that, that, that the, the people that, that got defeated would be cut up, and pretty soon bloodshed became involved, but it wasn't passive. Pretty soon, it had to be active bloodshed, where everybody was in there fighting to the death, and it, they just kept upping to keep the crowd. And that's the world in which they lived. It was a nonstop calendar of events that began in the capital city of Rome and then began to the furthest flung provinces of ever increasingly exciting spectacles, live gladiatorial fights to the death, and then men versus ravenous beasts, and then beasts fighting other beasts, and then duels and bloody deaths and shocking sights and intense visual stimulation. And soon the roar of the crowds became so intoxicating that no one wanted to miss an event. And these events would go for days at a time. And can you imagine what it felt like if you'd be in your shop working and you'd hear in the arena this loud roar and you'd go, oh, what did I miss? And everyone was just slowly drawn to not miss anything. That's why Paul the Apostle wrote to a church nearby Ephesus. By the way, the letter of Timothy goes to Timothy as he's pastoring in Ephesus. That's why it's called a pastoral epistle. Titus was working on Crete, Timothy was working in Ephesus. But Paul wrote this about the year 62 or so AD, the, the book of 1 Timothy. But just before that, about a year and a half, he had written a letter to a little city that's just 100 miles from Ephesus. It's called Colossae. You know, it's interesting to, to read the New Testament books and to think when Paul wrote them and who he wrote them to and what place he was in his ministry. But I want you to think for a minute. When Paul the Apostle wrote to a church near Ephesus where Timothy was serving, Paul wrote two years before 1 Timothy, he wrote 100 miles away to the city of Colossae. And Colossae was also in the very same Roman province. It was facing the very same distractions Ephesus was facing that Paul was writing Timothy on how to train the people of Ephesus. And Paul wrote to believers in Asia Minor, where both Ephesus and Colossae were, and he wrote to believers being doused with everything that the Roman world offered. Even today, the arenas, the amphitheaters, the theaters, the, the, the huge... Uh, horse race tracks, all of those things are dotting this, this region and, and tourists go to see them. But what did Paul write? He said, well, and let's turn to Colossians. Turn back from uh, 1 Timothy to Colossians because these were words Paul wrote exactly two years before 1 Timothy 4. But they're coming from the same general contractor and engineer, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit 
contracted 40 different men to write down his message. And, and he was putting a message through Paul to the Colossians, and then he puts a, another form of the same message through Paul to Ephesus by way of Timothy. But look at the, the same message that, that these people are hearing. And, and these two epistles are just two years apart. What the Lord says is, point your mind toward me. Paul had a very simple command in Colossians 3, and it's basically this. Choose where you park your mind, and you'll choose your destiny. Wherever you have comfortably lodged your mind, whether it's above, Colossians 3, 1 and 2, or whether it's below, which is the rest of that chapter describing, he said that's going to determine where you're headed spiritually in life. These sobering words breathed out by the Spirit of God through Paul, God's faithful servant. Look at verse 1 of Colossians 3. If then you were raised with Christ, and the construction is literally because it's true, since you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Because you're a believer, seek those things which are above. What's up there? Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. It's kind of like last week's discipline of devotion. Connecting to the source that will, that will fill our lives. So he says, focus uh, on what's above with Christ. Now look at verse 2. Set your minds on things above. That's the park. He says, you've got you to point your mind in the direction you want to go. Do you remember driver's ed? I mean, I took driver's ed in Hazlitt back in about 19, uh, what, 71 in Hazlitt, Michigan. And I remember uh, that the, the, the shop, I think he was the shop class teacher, was also the driver's ed teacher. And what he said is, he said, wherever you point that thing is where it's going to go. He said, so make sure you're looking straight and pointing that car. Because remember, they only had that little pedal on the right. And, you know, they were always grabbing the wheel with some of the... Have you ever ridden in the back seat with some of those crazy drivers and thinking you're going to die? Uh, because the driver's ed teacher only had a brake and could grab that wheel. But what he kept saying is, the car is going to go wherever you're pointing it. And if you turn that thing, it's going to go that way. Paul's saying the same thing. Look at verse 2. Set your mind, point your, your life on things above. Don't point them on things on the earth. Why? That sounds crazy. Why would I live for what I can't see when I can see all this and it looks so enticing? Look at the end of verse 3. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Verse 4. And when Christ, where our life is hidden, he is our life, when he appears, then we'll appear with him in glory. What he was saying is the overpowering gladiatorial gaming culture of the first century that troubled, tempted, and weakened the early church could be overcome. And, and those temptations, Paul said, could be, could be seen to be of lesser value if you realize and point and park, as it were, as verses 1 and 2 say, on things above. Well, what's amazing is all the, the temptations of the Roman first century have morphed into an even more alluring 21st century form. I mean, at least you, you couldn't sit in your shop and see what was going on in the gladiatorial games. You had to work and just wish you could go because you had the roar. Nowadays, whatever is going on in any gladiatorial event globally, we can have right with us, even mobily, even wherever we are. See, it's morphed in the 21st century into an irresistible and almost inescapable culture that even unsaved people around us are sitting up and sounding a warning cry. So, what's their warning cry? We need to beware of the ultimate temptation. Have you ever thought, what is the ultimate <laughs> temptation? I mean, as I say that, something different will probably register in your minds if you're still tracking with these thoughts. What's the ultimate temptation? For some people, it's a car. For some people, it's clothing, or it's a look, or it's an experience. For some people, it's a substance. For some people, it's an activity. But all of us have ultimate temptations. It's something that kind of smolders in the background, and we have to ask for God's grace to overcome, because it always is drawing us. 
what biblically is the ultimate temptation? The ultimate temptation is anything that distracts us from God. You see, the devil, remember the screw tape letters uh, with, with Uncle Screw Tape writing to the little demon? And he says, You don't have to get them to do fantastic sins. The only goal is to get believers to not set their hearts on things above. And, and it can work with anything. It can work with food. It can work with, with good things that aren't sin. But they become the ultimate temptation that pulls us away from God. We are to love him most. We are to seek him first. And we are to program God as the destination of life. We are to set him as the startup page of our day. Did you know in your computer, if you turn it off and then turn it back on, it has a home page? Most people never turn it off, so they rarely see it. But when, when you do, it comes to a home page when it, when it starts back up. What's the home page of your mind and heart and life? When we, Wednesday night, we studied the discipline of sleep in counseling uh, and discipleship class. When you go to sleep and you wake up for a new day, what's the home page? What's the starting place of your day? That's what God wants to be. He wants us to be making him the startup page of our day, and he wants us to tune our minds to listen to him. When you turn on the radio... In, in a, or, or tune in, you know, iTunes radio, you turn it to what you want to hear. Uh, you, you focus it on a spot. It's just almost, it's almost a, a reflexive act that, you know, you get in the car and, you know, uh, it's on the wrong station, you turn it to the new one, the one that is yours. God says, what are you turning the station of your life to? All of these choices come back to our minds. Anything that can even slightly pull our minds regularly away from God is a temptation. And today, we live in seemingly the strongest and most unrivaled temptation period since the days of Noah. Have you stepped back and seen where the entire culture of both America and the world is heading? Well, if you, if you haven't stepped back and looked at it, the sociologists are. And, and there's a guy named... Uh, Adam J. Cox. Uh, he writes for uh, the New Atlantis magazine. That means that, that he's not a real theologian at all. He writes for Harper's and all those uh, uh, different magazines and for the New York Times. But he's a clinical psychologist. And this is a journal article he wrote about the universal contact with electronic stimuli that we're raising young people in. You know, I was reading this article and uh, Bonnie and I were out eating, and we were watching some people with little children uh, at their table. And it was interesting, they had a, about a, a one and a half or two year old, and they had about a four year old or so, and then the couple. And as soon as they got them all pushed up to the table, the mother reached in her purse and pulled out an iPhone for each of them. And even the almost two year old, boom, 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 and was right in and just going away, and I don't know what they were doing. And they enjoyed a meal, the couple did, because of the complete distraction that their children had entered into. This is what the sociologist is saying. He's saying this universal contact with electronic stimuli is having an influence. And he writes this, 50 years ago, the onset of boredom might have followed a two hour stretch of nothing to do. In contrast, young people today can feel bored after 30 seconds with nothing to do, 30 seconds? Can you imagine if you get programmed as a young person that, that you start feeling this, this, this awful feeling after 30 seconds of not being totally gripped by something? He continues, the ubiquitous barrage of battery-powered stimuli delivered by phones, computers, and games makes the chaos of constant connection an addictive electronic narcotic. Now, this is a clinical psychologist in New York City who's examining young people whose parents are bringing them in who don't know what to do with them. And he's saying they have an addictive electronic narcotic 
He continues, as continuous stimulation becomes the new normal, the gaps between moments of heightened stimulation are disappearing. Amusement has squeezed the boredom out of life. For the hyper-stimulated, the synaptic mindscape of daily life becomes all peaks and no valleys. What he's saying is that normal people go like this, they go like this, and they stay here for a while, then they go up here, and then they come back. But he said this new generation has to be... They can't come down here. It's too painful to come down to real world where it's not flashing before their eyes and everything they want. And it's very hard for them to come out of that, is what he's saying. He continues to say, Cox worries about the deficits in the communication abilities of young males for whom a womb of all-encompassing stimulation induces a pleasant trance from which they do not care to be awakened. You understand in America that we have more and more 20 somethings that are living at home and can't seem to find their place doing anything. And they're in this womb of self absorption from which they don't want to be awakened. He continues self absorption, particularly among young males, may be the greatest danger immersion in the bath of digital amusement. Not only does that young male withdraw into electronic worlds, and enabling them to bypass the confusion and pain of trying to give their emotions some coherence, it also helps them avoid the reality of being a flawed, vulnerable, ordinary human being because they're living in a world that they can manipulate at will and they don't realize how hard life really is. He concludes by saying, the stratospheric increase in diagnosed learning and attention deficits is correlated with the advent of the electronic playground. When so many Americans meet the diagnostic criteria for attention deficit and hyperactive disorder, it is arguably no longer a disorder at all, it's just the way we are. He says, yes, we. It's not just boys, but adults of both sexes that are insatiably hungry for handheld devices that deliver them limitless distractions. He concludes with this, neuroscience has demonstrated that our brain is not a finished product. Our neural networks can be rewired by intense and prolonged experience. That's the ultimate distraction. It can take any form, but it becomes more attention-grabbing than God. So what do we do about it? Well, it's the discipline of time. We need to learn to reject profane and empty living. That's what it's saying in, in Colossians 3. That's what it's saying in 1 Timothy 4. The universal application is God wants all of us to be serious about spiritual things. And God wants us all restoring others. That's, we're supposed to go into all the world and make disciples. We're supposed to be teaching people how to focus on God. We have to learn how to focus on God. We have to see him as the source of truth. We have to be devoted to him and want to be connected constantly to him. And then we have to guard our time so we keep nurturing ourselves. And so what's the vital first step? When Paul addressed the church of the first century, he was talking to a world so much like ours. God wants believers who don't succumb to all the intoxicating idols that dull their minds. Things as harmless as comfort and convenience and security and work and sports and amusements, unrestrained by God's grace, become as deadly and powerful as addictions to alcohol, drugs, and sexual immorality. Why? Because God becomes weightless when we're drowning out the Holy Spirit's voice. If we are not if the home page of our life doesn't open up with us needing to hear the voice of God as we read the word of God, we're, something is drowning out his voice. If, if, if we can't start our day without the weather, but we can start our day without the voice of God, which is more important? The one who created the weather or the one who just narrates it to us. See, the, every part of life, the news, God is the author of the news. He's the one that's directing. Is it more important to just see what is happening or talk to the director? Is it more important to just try and figure out what is going on in, in the world or focus the homepage of my life at the source? The, the, we are drowning out the Holy Spirit's voice. And, and the way we do this, and, and I'll just read some of these, is God doesn't shout 
God doesn't push, he whispers. So we should avoid shallowness. That's when we struggle to find time to think about God's word long enough to apply it. Yet we have time to read the news and email and check our financials and the sports. That's a danger sign for God becoming weightless. We've become shallow. We are not allowing his truth into our life. We need to avoid forgetfulness. When we forget quickly what we read in the Word and can't think of a way to apply it in our life, yet we're able to describe our vacations and our sports events and our favorite movies to the nth degree, God has become weightless. When we're reading the Bible, we're just doing that to get it done, if we're even doing it, and we're not allowing Him to weigh in. We have to avoid indifference. If our job, our finances, or finding a girl or boyfriend, or doing well in school is more important than the Lord, we're indifferent to him, and he's weightless. Do you do your homework and excel at everything but your spiritual life? That means God's weightless. We need to avoid materialism. We're carefully devising our financial stability plans and security plans, but we never quite have enough time to get into the word and get it into our life every day. That means God's weightless. And you know what the Lord does in times like that? He rocks our boats. And we have these disastrous times. Well, to discipline my time by rejecting profane and empty living, I must reverse the erosion. How do we reverse the erosion? Look down at Colossians. You should still be there. It's a choice. Verse 1, seek those things which are above. You just honestly say to the Lord, Lord, Everything seems to be more important than you. I want to reverse this erosion. I want to today, Colossians 3, 1, to seek those things which are above. In verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. So first, reverse the erosion. Number two, look down at Colossians verse 5, chapter 3, verse 5. Put to death your members. He says, starve your flesh. Don't feed it. Don't don't say, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Say, I'm going to say no. I'm going to put to death my members that are on the earth. I'm going to seek first parking my mind with you. And then look down at at verses uh, 15 and 16. Let the peace of God rule. And verse 16 of Colossians 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I'm going to saturate myself with the word. That is the discipline of time. I'm going to reject anything, no matter how good and how not bad it is, if it distracts me from God. And, and the real key is, how much do God and his word directly challenge me into changing the way I think and act on a daily basis? It's not enough to just open. It's only enough until I open, I hear in my heart what God has said, and I pause before him, and I say, Lord, I want you to change the way I respond to my problems, the way I respond to my coworkers, the way I look at the purpose of my life, because you're weighing on me today. The discipline of time, rejecting, Profane, godless things. Things that are myths. All that entertainment stuff that's not even real. And inviting God to weigh down on my life, on my time. And say, God, I don't want you to be weightless anymore in my life and schedule. Let's bow for a word of prayer before we go this morning. Oh Lord, I pray that we would choose to not think that this message is for someone else. Every one of us were wired to be so easily distracted. That's why the Apostle Paul, by your spirit, said, we have to make a conscious choice to set our minds on things above. Now right here, while we're sitting, before we forget, I pray that bowed before you from our heart of hearts that we would offer a prayer to you saying, Lord, I want to seek you first. I want you to be the homepage of my life. I want to park my mind on things above. I want to go through life 
without being distracted by things that aren't necessarily bad, but they're my ultimate temptation because they push you to the margin. And Lord, I pray that right here, that we would begin the discipline of time so that your truth can be our devotion of our heart because we choose to say, no, I don't want to do that right now. I want to set my affection, my desires, my attention on things above. And Lord, I pray for anybody that's here this morning. Maybe they're just starting their new life in Christ. Maybe they've never started. Or maybe they're, they're in the ditch, as someone wrote me last week, and, and need a complete overhaul. Lord, wherever we are, you are here. We can cry out to you. But also at the end of the service, the elders and our godly Titus II women of the word are here, and they would like to pray with anyone. Lord, I pray that you would draw to yourself those who need to know your salvation are those that need a new start in making you the home page and making you have a weight on every part of life. We'll ask you to do this now for the glory of Jesus Christ and in his precious name we pray and all of God's people said, amen and God bless you as you go.